everyone. Um, day two feels like it's been a long conference already, maybe because I helped organize a little bit of it. Um, it's been really smooth so far. FrostCon people, just great organization. Only one complaint, it's not enough coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so today I'm going to talk about something that's really important to Drupal's future. And it's part of the reason Drupal's become popular as it is, and that is um, how Drupal handles caching. Why is it important? It's important because people are attempting to use Drupal for larger and larger sites all the time. Um, one of the projects that I'm involved with includes uh, basically moving all of Sony BMG's rock star artists onto Drupal each of them with their own site. That includes Justin Timberlake and Britney Spears and Ozzy Osbourne and basically all of the rock stars that you've ever heard of who don't belong to RCA or the other, the competitors, whoever they are. <laughs> um, so that's a lot of traffic and, you know, the web's getting bigger all the time and it's more likely that your site's going to get a lot more traffic than it was three years ago or five years ago. Just the, the scales are changing. So caching in Drupal is one of the reasons why it's able to handle any traffic. And if it's going to handle the traffic that we're going to send at it in two years, in five years, or for the Sony BMG sites, or for the next MySpace, the next Facebook, if you're going to build that on Drupal, then caching is going to be an important consideration. So when I talk about caching, what do I mean by that? When you talk about caching, you talk about executing some code in PHP, usually getting some information from the database, putting it all together in a way that's useful for your application. That can be a lot of work. That can be a lot of database queries, and that can be a lot of PHP processing, a lot of resources. Caching is the art of taking that thing that you've made with the PHP execution and the database queries and setting it aside and saying, okay, next time I need that, I'm not going to build it again. I'm going to just use it because I've, I've got it right here. Why would I build it every time when I've got it right here? That's called caching. Oops, typo. For example, if you build a page in Drupal, you can save that page. You've got it right here. You've built it. And the next person who requests that page, you can just hand it to them. And that saves a lot of the effort that Drupal would then normally go through uh, doing database queries and putting it all together for you. Caching saves time and resources because it avoids redundancy, the redundancy of database processing, or database queries and PHP processing. All caching, however, has a steep requirement. It needs to be smart enough to know when you can't simply take that page that you've already built and hand it to the next person because maybe it doesn't say something that's true anymore. Maybe the information on the page is outdated. Maybe it's the front page of your site and you just published a new article that should be at the top of the front page, breaking news. If caching wasn't smart enough to know when it was outdated, then that new article wouldn't appear at the top of your page. That old page that you'd already prepackaged and built would appear. If a page changes or if any cached data changes, you can no longer serve that data. So what can be cached and what does Drupal currently cache? anything in terms of data or a PHP or array or even a big string, anything that's not going to change for a reasonably long amount of time can be cached. When we talk about Drupal pages, 
those can be cached because for anonymous users because you always say sh show the same thing to anonymous users. Uh, there are caveats to that and there are places where you can break that rule. For example, if you wanted to show, um, if you wanted on the server side to generate the current time, then that would change every time you came to the site and you wouldn't be able to cache that. However, if you want to do that, you can cache the JavaScript that would generate the same thing and send that and have the JavaScript at a time. So there are al always workarounds, but there are also caveats. You can't always cache pages for anonymous users, but you usually can. And most sites that are built with Drupal use this. And um, you're probably familiar with Drupal's page caching. If not, we'll discuss it shortly. However, pages can't be cached for authenticated users. How would you feel if you went to Facebook and you got Constantine's profile instead of your own? Because Facebook cached Constantine's profile and sent it to you instead. The point is, when you log into Facebook, that's your data that changes for every user. If you go to Drupal.org, um, you can turn a block on called, what is it, developer something. What's that? Developer tools, right? It's, it's a block that has all sorts of links to things that are specific to you, like your issues. Um, or if you have the private messages module turned on, then that shows you what messages you have in your inbox. These things can't be cached because they change from user to user. So Drupal has a very large disparity between what can be cached for anonymous users and what can be cached for authenticated users. Drupal caches pages, but only for anonymous users. There's some other targets in Drupal that get cached all the time, um, sometimes on a per user basis. For example, um, Drupal's menu system gets cached. And I believe that gets cached on a per user basis. Isn't that correct? Every user gets for Drupal 5. That's been changed, as you will hear in uh, Chix's talk coming up. That's been changed for Drupal 6. But in current Drupal 5, uh, the menu gets built and then cached for every user. And this is automatic. Your site's configuration, called the variables, that gets cached as well. That doesn't change very often. And we know when it changes because you're the administrator. You go in there and you change a bunch of things and you press save and we know that we have to change the cache. Content which, get, which gets filtered gets cached. So if you write a blog post or a page or something and you have maybe the BB code filter in there. The BB code filter looks for all your BB code tags and makes the links and does the ordered lists. That's a bit of processing. We don't want to do that every time we serve that. So we cache it. These are all cases for pages, filters, menus, and variables where we know that they're going to stay the same for a long time. And we also have a clear point in Drupal where we can say, ah, we just changed a whole bunch of stuff. Let's throw all that old cached data out and build it new. So the two prerequisites to being able to cache these are, is it going to be current long enough to make it worth our while? And do we know when to clear it? So how does Drupal actually do caching? There's a caching API. API is one of the favorite terms that any could possibly speak it. It makes us instantly smile. <laughs> API. Just say it once. It's good. The caching API is defined and implemented in the file includes cache. Um, it's worth noting at this point that you can use other files to be your caching API and you have to set a variable cache underscore inc to give the path to the file that you use. And I'll show an example of doing that when I show, us, when I show you how to use the memcache module coming up.
So it's an API because it defines what you're supposed to do if you're a Drupal cache implementation. And it's also the implementation that is used in every normal Drupal installation. This API consists of three functions. It's a very straightforward API, and it even got simpler in Drupal 6. But this, is, this applies to Drupal 5. The first function is called cache get. Clearly, it looks into the cache and gets something that you're looking for. It takes two parameters. It takes key, which is uh, synonymous to CID in these other two functions, which stands for cache ID. And somebody should actually probably go in and change key to CID so that it's consistent. But cache get takes a key and a table. The key is a unique identifier that um, you assign to whatever it is that you want to cache. So if it's page number one, you could say page number one, and that would be unique enough for the case. It also takes a table because Drupal splits its cache over an arbitrary number of tables. Uh, Drupal comes with four tables, which I'll show you in a moment. But you can also make your own cache tables. And I'll talk to why you would do that in a moment. Then equally self-explaining is the cache set function. When you want to stick something into the cache, when you've built that object for the first time or that huge array or that page, and you want to put it someplace for later to get your hands on when you need it, you use cache set. It takes a couple more parameters, but the important ones are the CID, which is, in my example, page one. It takes the table that you want to put it into. Very important, it takes the data that you're putting into it. It takes uh, an expire parameter, which uh, gives the cache system some information on how long it should stay in there. And the headers parameter is um, a historical artifact that only really applies to page caching and no other, no, none of the other cache tables use that. So it's safe to ignore headers um, always, basically. And then last but not least, the cache clear all function, the third part of our API, um, is less self-explanatory because it only clears everything sometimes. <laughs> It also takes the CID and the table, but you can leave those blank. And if you send true into here, and I think a star for CID, then it cache clears all for whatever table that you're talking about. So if I wanted to clear the menu table, I'd send in null or star cache uh, menu and true here. It took me a while to figure that out because I thought you'd just leave this null, put the table in here, and put true in there, and that would work. But then my client called me up and said, hey, man, we're getting stale content on our site. And I did a little more research and found out that the star has to go there. There are examples all throughout the Drupal code. So I send you there to find them when you actually get around to trying this. Okay, I told you that. Told you that too. So about those tables. Um, first of all, there are four of them that Drupal implements when you install Drupal to begin with. Um, the first one is called cache, and that's kind of like a grab of random data that comes in small quantities that don't really merit its own table, that doesn't really merit its own table, you can put it in the cache table. So this is kind of like a free-for-all for everybody who wants to cache something, but not a lot of something, and you just need a convenient place to cache it or store it, you can use just the cache table. Otherwise, the cache page uh, table is the page cache. That's what actually stores built pages and then serves them to anonymous users. Cache menu, like I said, caches built menus per user. Cache filter is what caches the filtered content on your site so that you don't have to run the filters every time you generate content. When you want to cache your own data, say you were writing a module, um, you have to make a determination, do I have a lot of data that I want to cache and is it similar? 
Um, if so, then it merits making its own table. So um, you could say create cache table underscore foo, and then you could cache your foo objects. Um, the advantage of splitting the tables is um, goes back to the API. The advantage can be seen when you inspect this function. And exactly what I told you, if you want to wipe out a whole table of all its content, then you send in star, table name, true, and you basically erase everything in that table. If that table is sharing, is being shared by several different systems that are caching things, then calling that function in that way um, will basically invalidate caches that don't need to be invalidated. So that's why you split your tables, so that when we want to say, okay, there is there's reason, for whatever reason, there's a reason that we have to um, invalidate all of the menus. Maybe the administrator went in and added a new, a new menu item. So therefore, the menu has to be built, rebuilt for all users on the system. Then the system calls cache clear all for the, the cache menu table and says, there are no more menus on the system that are accurate, cached. We need to rebuild them all. If we were sharing that table with pages and menus, the way the API works, then we'd also delete all our cached pages and Drupal would have to go through the redundant effort of rebuilding those pages. That's why we split like objects and like sets of data into different tables. So if you're implementing a module and you want to add caching and you have a lot of data that's similar, put it in its own table. And it follows the naming convention cache underscore foo. But in reality, it can be any table name that you choose. However, any cache table for the Drupal API has to follow a certain schema. And I won't belabor this point here, but it has to have these five columns, cache ID, data, expiration date, created date, timestamp, and the headers, which almost nobody uses. Only the page cache uses headers. You can find a creative use for the headers in your cache table, in your caching system, um, but I wouldn't recommend it. Only because um, stuff like advanced caching and the memcache that I'm showing you presently gets a little bit harder. So if you want to find this in Drupal code, look in the system module in the system.install file and there's, there are a lot of examples there of um, Drupal creating cache tables. You can copy and paste that to make your own cache table. So when you're sticking stuff into the cache with cache set, an important thing to note is that it's going to be stored as a string and that means that um, Complex data, such as arrays and objects, needs to be serialized when you put it in and unserialized when you bring it out. That's for Drupal 5. Um, you have to do that manually yourself, for, whereas in Drupal 6, that has been moved into the, the abstraction layer itself, and the serialization happens automatically. So here are some examples. Strings are okay. If your data is a string, Go ahead, stick it in that cache, just like it is. If it's an integer, thanks to PHP's weak typing, that's going to be fine too. It'll get converted to a string, and you might need to cast it to an integer when you get it back out if it's important that you have that data type. Otherwise, it'll just come back as a string and be okay. Complex types, such as arrays, if your data um, is an array, you need to use the serialize function on that when you're putting it in and the unserialized function when you're bringing it out, Drupal 5. Drupal 6, that happens behind the scenes. Likewise with objects, this needs to be serialized as well. Okay, well, that's the end of my slides. So now I get to wing it. Um, this last slide says that 
stale cash items are removed with cash clear all. I just want to say another word to that. Um, I've explained the case where you want to er erase all of the uh, items in a table, but that's not always what you want to do. A lot of times what you want to do, hold on, let me make sure you can see this okay. Ooh, sorry. Hmm. Can you, uh, you see all that? Okay. A lot of times what you'd want to do is you just want to um, clear the cache of one cached item. So back to the page analogy, if you have a page and somebody edits that page, you certainly don't want to clear the cache of all of the pages because that would once again waste a lot of resources building the cache anew. So this function can be used by sending in simply the cache ID, page one, and the table, page cache underscore page, and only that single item will be removed from the cache. Um, you can also use this wildcard parameter to clear a set of items. So I have to look exactly how this works, but if you put um, a CID in, that's a part of a key that a lot of keys have in similar, that have a lot of keys have similar uh, in common, and you say wildcard equals true, then it'll clear all of those keys but leave the other ones intact. So let's say your table had um, apple one, apple two, apple three, orange one, orange two, and orange three you would be able to say the CID is equal to apple, indicate that it's a wild card, your apples would get cleared and your oranges would stay intact. Any complaining from the people who might know for exactly? It works, like that. it works like that, right? Okay. Good. So I want to show you a little bit practically what caching means to Drupal in terms of its performance. So here I've got a basic Drupal site that I've used um, the Devel module to make some content. So can I do a quick poll? Who here uses the Devel module? Okay, so I don't need to spend a lot of time showing you that, but I'll spend just a little time showing the rest of you because this is one of the best development tools that Drupal has um, so I grabbed the Devel module and installed it. You configure it here, and you can tell it to collect query info and display a query log. And what that does is it provides you this at the bottom of the page, a database queries that were executed in the building of this page. It also gives you a little more information. if um, if it were a particularly slow query, in this case over five milliseconds, then it comes up as red. And this column, the number column, um, is useful for indicating whether you're running duplicate queries, which is really bad because if you've already gone to the database to get some information once, there's no need to go and get it again. You should be holding on to that information in some way so that you can use it the second time you need it or the third time you need it. Um, and you, as you can see here, there are no duplicate queries because this column is all ones. And you can read the queries and you can get a good idea of the database work involved in generating any Drupal page. Very handy. I highly recommend the Devel module. It does other stuff too, but that's all I'm going to focus on right now. So let's take a look at the front page. It also comes with this block that has a lot of useful, fu useful functions, including emptying the cache. This basically wipes all of the cache from all of the tables. And when you do this, and then look down here at the information, you can see that this page, which is the front page of a generic Drupal site for an authenticated user, requires 181 database queries to generate the first time. And that took um, 100 milliseconds of PHP processing. 
Oh, no, that <laughs> of database processing. The, uh, the entire page took 500 milliseconds. Okay, so that was after I cleared the cache. What about when I reload it and we get the advantage of all of the things that got cleared, then got rebuilt, are now in the cache and will now be brought in um, as, a, as an improvement on the second page load. So we started at 101, or 181 database queries. That went down to 134. The fact that it took seven times as long on the database is more um, an, a quirk of running on this system in this environment. If we normalized that, it would be somewhere in between. Um, you don't need to worry about that. Let's see what happens when I run it yet again. Yeah, see there it's even lower. So it's just, it takes a different amount of time every time. But the database query stays the same. So for those of you who want to or who will find yourselves building Drupal sites that need performance because they have a lot of users or a lot of traffic or because they do complex things or whatever, you'll find that very often the database is the bottleneck because of the sheer number of database queries that Drupal generates, all of which is the price we pay for flexibility. And we constantly look for database queries to get rid of or to uh, simplify. Um, but sometimes it comes to a point where in order to do that, you'd give up flexibility. So that's where caching comes in. It took it from 181 database queries to 134 database queries. That's 50 queries per page, more or less. That's already a very big win. Now let's look at the difference. Let's clear the cache again. Oh no, I need to show you first. So under your site configuration in the performance area, um, here you have the caching controls that you have to play with. Um, I want to disable the cache, first of all, one time, and then look at the site as an anonymous user in this different browser that I have open. Yeah, I'll just do it. Okay, so here there's no page caching. And we can see that for the anonymous user, the number of queries, 109, is somewhat less. Let's see if they also benefit from caching on the second load. Yes, they do. They get a little bit of caching um, problem in their menu. Um, took it down to 104 queries. Now let's see the effect of um, the page cache, which this deals with. This only deals with the page cache, by the way. Uh, when you look at the performance section in your site configuration, that doesn't deal with the menu caching, the filter caching, or the variable caching that I told you about. That happens automatically all the time, no matter what you do. And that's good. Page caching, however, um, that's something where sometimes you need to turn it off. And you've also got two different uh, modes of page caching that I'll explain in a moment that you have to choose from. Let's, let's use the normal page caching and see if we can get that lower than the 101 queries, 104 queries that we have here. Okay, so that's the first hit. That's when the cache was cleared. Ah, look at that. It disappeared. The unfortunate thing is that the develop module doesn't work for anonymous users with page caching because the page gets built, even if you set the permissions up so that you're supposed to see it, the page gets built normally and then cached, and then you get the cached copy. So what can we do? To find out how many queries there are? I can set a breakpoint in the, the query function, and I added this little code that'll just count how many times this gets called. So then we can go in and see. Any guesses, by the way? Placing bets right now, how many queries? 
page caching turned on. You've heard how great Drupal's page caching is. One. Do I hear two? Going for two. Two? Five? Ten? How many people say there will be more than ten queries? Okay. How many people say there will be five queries? Okay. So, there's one. Two. Yeah, go. Push the right button. Three. Four. What are all these queries? Let's look. <coughs> Select data. Oh, it's getting the page cache. So on the fourth query, it's getting the cached page. What are those first three queries? We can go back and look in a moment. So. Query number five um, needs to find the theme. Six, seven, eight, nine. Come on. Ten. Ten queries. Who wins? Who said ten? Okay, so yes, page caching is great. It took it from 104 queries to 10 queries. But that's still 10 queries. What if, what if your database goes offline? Wouldn't you still want your site to be there? Don't you? I mean, okay, that's not possible with database caching. That's possible with mem caching. Um, let's go back now, and I'll explain the difference between this normal and aggressive caching. So there are these functions in Drupal called hooks that modules can implement. And two of them are called the init hook and the exit hook. And they're not necessarily critical to building some pages, depending on what module you have. So normal caching still invokes those hooks and any modules that do anything in those hooks like database stuff um, like the devel module those 10 some of the at least one of those 10 queries came from the devel module so it's a little bit of an unfair example that I showed you because I installed the module that added some queries to the, the cached page there are other modules that do that too and you'll see the list of those modules in this red bit down here. And you can see that Devel module is listed. It's kind of small. You'll see the Devel module is listed here. If you've got a lot of modules listed here, or any modules that you care about, then you can't use the aggressive page caching because what the aggressive page caching does is it skips the init and the exit hooks altogether and it never fires them. So, for example, the Devel module doesn't get its chance to collect the, the query statistics that it collects for you to analyze later. And a lot of, a lot of other modules do statistics, um, cleaning up resources, and stuff like that. They'll all be listed here in this red bit, and that basically means don't use aggressive caching. But if you don't have anything listed here, or if it's just the Devel module and it's just for you, then you can use aggressive caching. So let's see what the aggressive caching does. Oops. Got to take that breakpoint away. Let's see what the aggressive pad caching does to our cached page here. I'm going to rebuild the cache once. Then I'm going to go back. I'm going to set that breakpoint. hit the page again and we can count so one let's look at the queries these time this time around okay so it gets some access information can you see this page you need to know that before you can serve it cached or not so there's one query query number two okay it's building the user object for the session you need to have a user even if it's the anonymous user Query number three, here we go. Here's the cache for the variables. So one cache query. 
Query number four. Here's the page cache. Query number five. Get some more information for the session. Update the session object so we have some information about this anonymous user because we track the anonymous user's sessions as well as the authenticated users. So what do we have? Six? Six queries. So that's Drupal page caching and basically all of the caching that Drupal does by itself in core. Any questions at this point? The rest of the stuff I'm going to explain is um, it's for sites that need performance boosts badly and have advanced needs. So any questions about core Drupal? Uh, what's the um, time when session items are rebuilt? For example, if I change the, the menu, is the cache uh, rebuilt in this instant or uh, the next time the page is added? It's cleared in the instant that you change it. It's rebuilt the next time that it's needed. So that's akin to lazy instantiation, although it's kind of a, a, a a mixed metaphor. Was that the question? Another question. Okay, then I'll move on to the advanced cache modules and the memcache modules, starting with the memcache module. Um, somewhere, I've got slides for this one. Those aren't dumb. Might be that I okay. So, how many of, have, of you have heard of memcache? Okay. Memcache is um, it's a technology that was developed for storing things in memory. And you probably all are aware of the fact that when something's in a computer's memory, it's the easiest, fastest way to get to it. Okay, it's faster than having to go to the disk. It's faster than the database, which is also on the disk. Basically, if you want to have something available and fast, put it in your memory, in the computer's memory, and it's available to you there. So memcache is a generic technology for building a hash table of keys and bytes. Okay, it's very simple. It doesn't care what the key is. It doesn't care what bytes you put into it. It's just a key and a byte, and it's really good at getting those bytes out when you ask for the key. You can ask for a lot of keys and get a lot of sets of bytes. And um, it's because of this simplicity, it's become the poster child for Web 2.0 sites like Facebook who serve enormous amounts of traffic and could fill this room with their servers twice. Um, It'll save you a lot of money on servers if you have to scale and become very large. It'll also make your Drupal site quite fast because um, the way that we use it in Drupal is to take all that stuff that we just talked about in the cache tables, and instead of putting it in the database, we put it in memory instead. So the, the memcache Drupal module consists of a couple parts, a module to do the administration stuff, an include file, memcache.inc, and um, this file implements the caching API that I told you about at the beginning. So this isn't the presentation. But you're all familiar with, if you're familiar with Drupal, then you're familiar with the settings PHP file, which in 4.7 you had to edit by hand to get your database connection in 5.0, it gets made for you. 
but um, chances are you've looked inside of it anyway. Um, in the settings PHP file, you can also set variables that'll be, um, that will change the way your site behaves. Not many people know this, but this is all in the instructions for the memcache module. Anytime you want to uh, change the caching API, here's how you do it. Yeah. Oh, this is TextMate. Um, TextMate does weird things to you. I never program PHP in TextMate. He does. Okay, <laughs> text, TextMate does weird things like if I... Okay, that's right. That's what I want. So in t settings PHP, you can create this array called conf, and any of the variables that you have in your site that you change in the user administration interface normally, you can hard code them here. And one of the ones that you need to hard code, you can't change it anywhere else, would be um, cache.inc. This is the location of the cache API implementation that you want to use. Normally, like I said, it's includes slash cache.inc. However, you can do something like this. So sites all modules is the location of your contrib modules in a Drupal install. Let's say you downloaded the memcache module. It has a memcache inc file. If you put that in your um, settings PHP file, then you've included the memcache implementation of the caching API. And there are other modules like um, the fast path file cache or something like that, that also, um, no, strike that. That module does something different. Forget I said it. There are other modules like the APC cache that require you to include a file like this, which switches out the implementation of the cache API. Okay, so back to memcache. I got off on a tangent. Memcache has a couple other advantages. I should probably trust my slides a little more here. Where's my remote? Okay. I'll go with the slides. So who should use memcache? Um, I know somebody who uses it on his personal blog. Took the um, page requests down from more 400 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds. He was excited. He's a developer. Most people won't notice the difference. Large media sites would be a good candidate for using memcache. Um, one of the clients that I work with has a yearly spike in their traffic. Um, they have an awards television show, and basically everybody ignores their content all year long, not really, and then watches the awards ceremony in October, November. So like their traffic literally quintuples. They have a lot of traffic. They're an international media site. But they have a hell of a lot of traffic during this awards ceremony, which you can see by Alexa charts. So when they get to that time of year, they set up five Linux boxes that they keep off their network th or they use for other things um, the rest of the year. They fill them full of memory. They turn them into memcache servers. And they get through the spike just by adding dumb, empty boxes with memory to the network. It couldn't be easier from a sysadmin point of view than turning on a machine, installing the memcache package, and just letting it be there. The spike, they turn the machines off and, you know, let the developers keep developing on them or whatever. So that's who can use memcache. Um, a moment of explanation. Uh, when I looked for this set of slides, I realized that I had erased the one that I had updated this morning, and I'm now showing you one that's about six months old. This soon to come, that's already come. We, we've already got these things, so no need to dwell on that. Okay, once again, the slides. We missed one. Yeah.
Sorry, I think we started in the middle. <laughs> we did. Okay. When determining whether to use memcache for your site and in your project, one of the um, first questions you need to ask yourself is, do you have spare memory on your network already? And if not, can you get some? For example, um, Alan in the back there works for a company called Now Public. And Alan, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but when they started implementing uh, memcache on their network, they found free memory on web servers, free memory on the file server, free memory on your server that like does media conversions, you know, like trans encoding and stuff like that. That's right. It's still how you have it, right? Okay, so um, there goes my NDA agreement with now public. But <laughs> um, so they were able to find memory to use for memcache that was sitting idle on a lot of their existing boxes. They didn't even have to buy new hardware. You also have to ask yourself when you're facing a scalability or performance bottleneck, what's going to be cheapest? Adding more web servers? They take a lot of configuration. You've got to replicate the PHP files to each new web server you add. Web servers are more than likely not your body running um, separated web servers and database servers. You could add more database servers. It's very likely that the database is the bottleneck. And if you want to solve that bottleneck, then you might be tempted to look for a database solution. Replication, clustering, what do you do? These are really tough sysadmin decisions. If you do um, replication, you have a master and a slave database, or many slaves, then you have to, um, you have to do routing of your SQL queries so that um, mutator queries go to the master and um, reading queries go to the slaves. It's, it's not easy. It's not trivi trivial. Or more memory servers. You buy any computer off the shelf in any computer store, plug it into your network, install Debian, put memcache on it, done. And it doesn't even have to be a good computer. If you've got a Pentium 3 sitting around, it will handle memcache. It's fast enough for that. You might not want to do that if you're running a production site, but if you have one, why not? All it does is look up stuff in memory. So that's the cheapest way to do it. So with memcache, you can get less PHP processing, fewer database queries. And what I really want to tell you next is about the redundancy of caches. So Drupal does database caching for many reasons. But one of the reasons um, why we do that instead of, say, file caching is because it's easier to keep all of the cache in a single location and only cache things once. It's a very important consideration when you're caching things because it's already complicated enough when you're clearing caches to cache it centrally and to know that. But if you have to also cache things on like five web servers and you, clear, you, cl you have to clear the things on the five web servers, then you have to guarantee that you've cleared all five web servers else one web server might be serving one version of the cache and then the next web server might be clearing another version. And that's what I've depicted in this diagram is a situation where you have redundant caches. These three machines are caching the same things for themselves. Much better is a system where you share a single cache. With memcache, you can do that. It's an, it's an HTTP protocol. And um, no, that's wrong. Well, in any case, it's a network-based protocol that when I start when I start talking network acronyms, somebody just hit me with a bottle over the head because I'm bound to get myself into trouble. Um, it's a network-based protocol, and all of your web servers depicted on the left can have access to um, the cache central on the right. And it manages concurrency and you know stuff like that. So that's great. You don't have to worry if you clear the cache once that you know 
uh, web server X doesn't get it, you know, that it's still got an old copy. So what do you actually need for memcached? You need a couple things. You need a, a Linux program called memcached, memcached. You can get that here. It's the top result on Google for memcache in case you need to find it later. For PHP to talk to that, you need the, um, the pickle extension um, memcache. So you install that um, like you install any other pickle extension, pickle in extensions. Um, basically, get the source, PHP eyes, configure, make install. Need some spare memory. Um, at the time, I thought a conservative estimate was four megabytes to start with. I've now run memcache with one megabyte. It's great for a small site. That's plenty. If you've got a megabyte spare on your 128 megabyte version, you can run memcache and get a performance benefit. Facebook runs terabytes of memcache. I don't know how many terabytes, but that's a lot of, that's a lot of memory. And finally, you need the, the memcache module from Drupal. And this is where we started, which consists of a module, an implementation of the cache API, and a small patch, which is a backport of some changes to the cache system that we made for Drupal 6, namely the serialization business that I was talking about, where the serialization is now done all behind the scenes. OK. Um, any questions about memcache? I mean, that's a little bit abstract, but um, hopefully that gets you thinking a little bit. Um, oh, I didn't tell you. I'll come to that. One, one thing that I didn't tell you or didn't make really clear is that the way the memcache works, since it implements the caching API, it takes the page cache, the variable cache, the menus, and instead of putting them in the database, it puts them in the memory instead. So the caching that Drupal already had got that much faster. And if your database was the bottleneck, that's that many queries less that it'll have to do. Your question. Thank you for asking, because I should have told you that. Um, memcache is really, really smart in that it has clustering built into it. So you can, um, if you read the README and the memcache module, it will give you clear examples on how to cluster your memcache. Say you, you determine you have three web servers and each has 10 megabytes free. And you think you can take those 10 megabytes and use them for memcache. Memcache will cluster those megabytes, so you've got 30 megabytes, and it will see that as one cache pool. And you can do this indefinitely. That's how Facebook ends up with terabytes of cache, and they just throw servers on there. They probably don't even put hard disks into the servers. They probably net boot them somehow, and they come online already configured to you know, join the pool. They don't even need a hard disk. It's crazy. Um, and it just joins the pool. And memcache will use the extra space as it becomes available. It will also react to one of your memcache servers going offline. For example, you've got those three servers, each with 10. Maybe web server 2 goes down. Um, and all of a sudden, memcache only has 20 megabytes. It'll react. It will do the right thing. Um, Yeah. Other questions about memcache? I haven't, but that's. Right, your server center. Right. 
Right. Um, I would say if, if you're concerned about that, if you're really concerned about how you're going to scale and you're talking a lot of machines one way or another, the fact that you could net boot uh, an empty box with just RAM and no hard drive is a good indication that you will save heat and electricity by running memcache instead of trying to scale your database or your web servers. I've not benchmarked this and I don't have any experience with anybody who's done this, but I know that it's possible. Good distinction. Caching database tables versus caching built PHP objects. There's no table in the Drupal schema that accurately represents an entire node that has 50 CCK fields. That's a lot of tables. And they're normalized somewhat, mostly. And you have to use a lot of joins to put them together and you have access checks and you have filtering that goes on. So you have thousands of lines of PHP code that queries dozens of tables just to build one node. If you, ca if you could cache that node object already built and save yourself all of those queries, multiple queries, all of the PHP processing, that would be a really big win. And that's what you can do with memcache and also with the Drupal cache. Um, Gabor just committed a patch for Drupal 6 that does node caching. No, that wasn't the right button. Anyway, you guys can watch the lullabot spin. Um, so yeah, MySQL table caching is really great, or whatever database engine, is really great when we're talking about a table, but we're not talking about a table. We're talking about built PHP objects. And since every person's site can build that PHP object a different way, there would be no way to, say, efficiently denormalize that built data into a different table. It would be really difficult programmatically. Was that clear enough? Right. Would you be interested in benchmarking that for us? And helping. I mean, I'm serious about this for anybody who could help me benchmark any of this and profile it and help experiment with this stuff. Um, there are very few people working on it, but a lot of people who are interested in it. So I'm trying to drum up some more interest and some more support. Um, I can only tell you I suspect that the first row of scalability after you've got maybe three web heads and a database server, maybe hot you know, a hot replication backup, you know, slave somewhere that you just keep sitting um, ready in case you've got, you know, failover needs. I suspect that most people's best front, first, first line of defense for scalability is memcache in Drupal. Um, it's too bad Gerhardt isn't here. We just implemented memcache on Drupal.org and we saw an improvement. We had some problems with it. Um, we ran around time and time again. Um, started out the configuration wasn't ideal and I have to talk to him to get an update. Um, it, it worked somewhat less ideally than um, I had expected. The, the page caching seems to have a bug in it still that I have to fix. But the other stuff works. Um, yeah, are you talking about like the query cache? The problem, I think the problem with, they might be, there might be a good hit ratio on the query cache for cache tables, um, in which case they would be in memory. Uh, the Drupal.org server doesn't have enough memory currently to hold whole tables in its memory, where uh, Gerhardt is going to buy a new server for the database that'll have 16 gigabytes of memory, at which point we should have enough memory to do some interesting stuff. Um, 
but if we talk about people's sites in general, where everyone has a different set of needs and a different profile of the equipment, then I think my statement um, gains some more weight that it's, it's often a very good thing that people can implement because you can, even on a single server environment where you're running the database, the web server on the same box, even if that's a virtual private server or shared hosting, shared hosting hard because you can't install the memcache library. Theoretically advantageous, but good luck getting your host to do that. So a virtual private server or dedicated server where, you know, it's just one machine, whole site, database, web server, um, you can really save your database a lot of work by turning to memcache. And the memory, when you do a cache set and put something into it, and the memory is full, it pushes something else that's not often used, the least often used item gets pushed out. Um, there are two implementations in the memcache module of the cache API. There's memcache.inc and there's memcache.db.inc. They differ in that the memcache.inc keeps everything in memory, never looks to the database for cache. This will give you, you, give you your very best performance in the ideal case because you never have to write or read from the database for caching. However, if you don't have enough memory to store all of your cache or the most often used cache items, then you'll do a lot of, um, you'll have a lot of cache misses where then Drupal has to regenerate that item, be it a page or a menu or whatever, and you lose the benefit of caching to begin with. So for most people who have only modest memory available, then you'll want to use cache.db.inc, which um, writes everything into memcache and the DB, looks to memcache first, <coughs> looks to the DB second if memcache didn't provide anything. So, um, how much time do we have left? Uh, no time, but, uh, but uh, there's, no, there's no other talk behind this talk, so... Okay, I'd like to spend just two or three minutes then introducing the advanced cache module. Um, don't really need to be looking at that the whole time. Um, there has been a lot of discussion about other caching targets, such as blocks or nodes, both of which are now cached in Drupal 6. Um, other things that could also be cached are comments, paths, path aliases. Um, there's stuff in forum and book module that could be cached. There, the, Drupal is just basically a gold mine of uncached stuff. Stuff that fits the qualification of being cacheable. We could find a, a case for caching it that would save us processing power, that would make things faster. But nobody's implemented it. So the advanced cache module is a set of patches for Drupal 5 that does just that. It implements caching in some of the places that currently doesn't have it. It caches nodes, it caches comments, it caches taxonomy tables, terms and vocabularies, and the terms to node mappings. It caches um, forum definitions, it caches <laughs> it caches a lot of stuff. And it's all in the form of patches that you can apply to your Drupal 5 site. And um, it then creates new database tables to cache these caching targets. And when used with memcache, that's really great because all of a sudden, then you have a lot more memcache targets going on. So um, my second plea for help is that if anybody is interested in working on this type of stuff, the advanced cache module um, is an interesting place to start and it has a lot of ideas of how you can do these things. And I need help with it. I need help bug testing it, developing it, maintaining it, um, profiling it, and things like that. So um, for those of you who want to have really, really, really fast Drupal sites, I can highly recommend taking a look at Advanced Cache and Memcache as a team of modules that uh, will take you places that 
No other Drupal site has ever gone. <laughs> so, any other questions about caching? Yes, sir. Uh, depends caching means manifest. No, it doesn't. Independent. It's independent. It's completely independent. It it inst it installs new caching database tables, and you can choose and select which bits you want to use by applying individual patches, or you can use all of it because it's all of them. Yep, which for those of you who haven't done patching, it's really easy. Um, basically, you do something like this. You go, come on, you go into your Drupal directory in a shell. Uh, and you say, patch. Okay, I'm going to try this blind. P-A-T-C-H. You use the less than sign, and then you type in the path to the catch, uh, to the patch, the path to the patch, which would be um, something like um, node patch, like this. So that's the only command you have to learn. When I hit enter, then it asks you uh, to confirm the path to the individual files that need to be patched, but that's interactive, so you should be able to figure out what it does. So if any of you previously had great fear when you heard the word patch, don't. If you want to get rid of what you just did, like um, you do it and your site breaks, then you just do that, type enter, it's gone. It's that easy. That's why people use patches. It's because it's easy. Any other questions? Yeah, you can share you can share the daemon for any number of clients. I can even tell net into a daemon and add and retrieve items manually. So all of the popular programming languages have implementations, and they can share it. Um, you have to pay a little attention about key um, collisions, but I've taken great care in the way that the um, keys are created that you can always avoid that unless your Java application is doing something like Drupal memcache page cache as a key, <laughs> you know, which it shouldn't be doing. So you're basically guaranteed never to have key collisions, um, plus, you can have multiple demons running on a machine. So if you wanted to keep them separate, you could do it that way as well. Other questions? File system caching. You could do that, or web servers can use each other's memory for memcache. That's a more typical configuration. Web servers are very often um, CPU bound, and database servers are often memory bound. So web servers are often the place where you have um, spare memory. And if your network has a file server or a mail server, Christmas, <laughs> memory galore. The reason we don't use file-based caching is because without extra configuration, every web server basically has its own local file system and you end up with redundant caching. You could do file-based caching with an NFS mount or some LVM, okay, but you've got to have Linux sysadmins who can do these things. You have to be running a, a NFS system or uh, server and be able to set up um, NFS mounts. Then file-based caching would work because you have a centralized caching location. If you're running one box, file caching is an option. And for that matter, so is APC caching. Um, APC is an opcode cache. Um, if you have that installed, it can also work as a memory, an object cache, just like memcache. And there's an APC caching module that's faster than memcache. So if you have one server, one database, one web server on the same machine, 
The APC cache is another option for doing in-memory caching. Other questions? If you've got a website, you need a system to manage your content Drupal. If you want to build a web application, you've got to download Drupal. Drupal, 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 Drupal. If you've got a website, you need a system to manage your content Drupal. If you want to build a web application, you got to download Drupal. Drupal, 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 Drupal,